and to all the team here. Really appreciate this invitation to speak to issues of actually long-standing concern about the safety, dignity, and survival chances of, of people in crisis settings. And basically, you know, scrunching this down, concerns are twofold, that there has been a lot of slippage. I mean, anything I'm going to say is not news, but there has been significant slippage that is ongoing since the inauguration launching of treaties and standards after World War II and of course since then. And at the same time, aid agencies in my experience, but also in terms of studies and uh, examinations have been, you know, in my view, always lukewarm about the protection dimension, about protection needs. And my concern is that uh, this persistence and ignoring protection problems as we lose slippage, whether it's in the Security Council or in terms of compliance with treaties, that we're in a worse off situation than we have been in a long time. So it's also not news then for me to say that we're operating in, in a very fast changing world. We all know that authoritarianism is on the rise as democracies also, the word I have here is ravaged, you know, by, by populism and inequalities. Um, at the same time, of course, change is not all negative. We have seen, and as I speak, you know, in recent times, street protests from Khartoum to Hong Kong, people going onto the streets in Russia and Belarus, and um, where else did I have listed here? Oh, yeah, Myanmar, of course, this past week. And of course, this past, I can't say summer, but I guess it was last summer, the Black Lives Matter movement that erupted, not just in the United States, but across the world, including here in Geneva. We've also seen, and it's a particular problem, I think, or maybe because I'm, I'm sitting in Europe, the rise of nationalism and xenophobia and the implications of that then for people who are seen as the other. And that this is happening, of course, in the midst of what I call turbocharged globalization. I mean, globalization will keep changing, but it's not something that's going to go away. And this is also happening as the climate crisis is intensifying. And I guess those of you in the United States are conscious of that given what has happened in Texas this past week. And as most of us, I think, are associated with the UN, we're probably quite sensitive to the retreat, is how I'm calling it, the retreat of multilateralism or the withering of multilateralism. And what that means then in terms of a decline of a rules-based order. I think we're also conscious, this morning I was listening to the great strides China has made which is a positive, of course, in tackling poverty. But it's clear that the big shifts in um, geopolitical balance of power, um, all, and that includes, as I've put it here, you know, good riddance to the end days of colonialism, but we've also seen the rise of the uh, GWAP, the Global War on Terror, and counter-terror programs that are particularly of concern in situations of acute distress. So in other words, while that's the context in which people in situations of distress are trying to survive, this changing order or disorder is also part, as I see it, and we can discuss, is also part of the dynamics driving the undermining of treaties and standards. And those of us, Martin knows, has probably talked a little bit about yeah. United States and humanity, but what we see and are concerned about the normalization of atrocity. And when I say that, um, I will come actually to a few examples of this past week. But um, while these you know, existing treaties and standards are obviously important, we've always known, but maybe also not known enough, that they're only useful insofar as they are used. I mean, these treaties are important, but they're important because they're supposed to make us more civilized in, in regular situations as, as well as situations of acute distress. And the concern there, having been, you know, a long time humanitarian, also having worked on human rights for a big part of my life, you know, aid agencies working in the humanitarian and development fields, you know, have a long history of ignoring, I said at the beginning, of ignoring, and in some cases, unfortunately, exacerbating the protection needs of people who are most at risk. And at the same time, and again, for all of us who are familiar with the UN, you know, we have a long history of investing in reform efforts and as well as, you know, training, uh, um, capacity building, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I guess two or three years ago, the centrality of protection was introduced 
as a way of trying to advance the agenda that protection is central to what we do in, in situations of crisis. But I have to say, um, I think it was two years ago, I was in Syria doing a study for what I'm going to say is an important donor. And I was told, and most of us are familiar with the protection cluster, was a senior colleague in a protection cluster who was quite adamant that barrel bombing, for example, and sieges, that these were political problems, that these were not of concern to humanitarians. And when I asked quietly, well, how do you see ICRC? Do you relate to it as a political or humanitarian agency? And he just kind of flipped his hands and says, there's no way we can engage in these kind of problems here in Syria. And of course, I guess the same goes for Yemen, Central African Republic, et cetera, et cetera. I'm keeping my eye on my, on my watch, hoping I'm not going to take up too much time. So I said that this past week when thinking about meeting you guys today, I'm going to flag three or four, four different incidents that have come up in reminding me um, that the situation is not getting better. And one was in relation to Tigray. I had a back and forth with a colleague in a well-respected big NGO that was working there. And this colleague was raising concerns about not having access. And when I noted that, uh, you know, agents talked about the dilemma, that this is a dilemma. I says, no, it's not really a dilemma because we've always prioritized presence over protection. And this is a big discussion, but that, you know, in my experience is what we have done. And worse than that, we tend to prioritize presence, which is vital, I'm not questioning that, you know, because of uh, institutional interests. It's not good for the bottom line if as an agency, you in or NGO, we're, we're not present in particular crisis settings. And any of my discussions, uh, as I've spent a few decades in the humanitarian sector, when I say, well, what is the, you know, humanitarian work, humanitarian business is really about life-saving. That's what we claim, look at any mission statement and that's what is known, it's, it's life-saving. And then from that, and you know, I started out in the 1980s by accident. So not like the young people these days coming out of college. And I've always understood that life-saving is understanding what are the most threatening dangers that people feel in a particular situation. Of course, sometimes as we saw in Somalia 10 years or whatever, it's the drought. Uh, but in other in situations such as right now in Yemen and in recent times, but continuing in Syria, but also in Afghanistan, of course, Central Africa, America, that, you know, the biggest threat to life and the rever reverberations of that is the way warfare is conducted and what that does to people's ability to stay safe and to survive. The other incident that came up was last weekend. A friend came back from working on the Al Hal camp, I'm maybe mispronouncing it, and other camps in Northeast Syria, where I guess most of us will know, because actually it's never much in the news, but this is an encampment where ISIS families, that's how I'm going to describe it, those when they lost their territory in 2017, so it's going back a few years, the families, 80% of them women and kids, are in this what sounds like a god awful place. Um, and looking at the figures the other day, 27,000 children from 60 countries are stuck and stranded in this place. And when I was asking this colleague, um, I'm surprised that I've spoken to her a year ago that one hears so little about it. And then I went online. So coming back to my earlier point, a lot of you good folk are connected to UNICEF or have been. You know, what you see, what UNICEF is saying is doing all the right things in terms of supporting learning, clean water, latrines, and child-friendly spaces. But where is the attention to the actual situation where children who are born into this god-awful situation, you know, they are dying because the countries of their parents refuse to take them back. Uh, and when I try to discuss how come this isn't a big campaign with all the aid agencies from ICRC to lots of big NGOs, the answer was that, um, well, the donors and the agencies don't want to make a fuss, but I couldn't get further as to why you don't want to make a fuss. Uh, I mean, some countries such as Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan have taken back children whose parents are their nationals, but many European countries and others have not done so. So then the third point that came up, and I guess many of you have seen it, uh, that um, 
Mark Lokos, no, Lo Lokos, Lokos, Mr. Lokos, the emergency relief coordinator has stepped down and three agency coalition, NGO coalitions, ICFA, Inter Interaction and SCHR. Standing committee. Standing committee, thank you. Um, you know, have written rightly and understandably about how to select the next one. And what they say, it's, it's a letter, is that mobilizing resources are the lifeblood of humanitarian action. Now, not our compassion or our adherence to humanitarian values, but it's that. So I think, you know, for me, this sets off alarm bells in my head. And then the last case I have here is Myanmar, which has been in the news this past week for all the reasons that we know. And I had the good fortune, so I see it, of being able to visit there two years ago for a very, very short visit. And have since stayed, you know, tried to be a little bit in touch and how that situation was evolving. And of course, we've seen the big regression, although it's not a big surprise if one understands a little bit about Myanmar and the extent to which society is so antagonistic, for example, to the people of Rohingya. It's not just the military, the Tatmada. And, but I'm reminded for the point of this discussion today is that when I was there in 2018, the, one of the big dramas was that the humanitarian resident coordinator, I just for by her first name, Renata, was at loggerheads with much of the aid community. On the one hand, you had the development side of things, uh, supporting Renata in where she had prioritized her relationship with the government. And on the other hand, you had human rights and humanitarians, I would say almost across the board, uh, raising concerns that if you don't look at the human rights deficit, this is what drives, of course, persecution, discrimination, displacement. And I was there a few months after what the UN has called the genocidal intent of the military in, in Rohingya when the people, um, the Rohingya had to disperse and try to find shelter in Bangladesh. And, you know, going back over that a few days ago, it, it really does, I think, draw caution to the first issue about this slippage from the treaties that were introduced after World War II so that we would never uh, be reduced to that level of um, lack of civilization again. And just to finish on Myanmar, I mean, the debate is that the human rights agencies, sorry, the development age, development types, and some of them as resident coordinator, I spoke to a few weeks ago uh, when there was another headline and it was about connected to Sri Lanka. And I was told, Honora, you guys, Office of the High Commissioner, you guys deal with human rights. We've got to do development. So the fact that in the 21st century, you know, the UN has been in Myanmar on, since 1948, when it got independence from Britain. The UN has been there since 48, so that must be about 75 years ago or a little bit more. And yet uh, in 2020, there is still of the views many that human rights, the right to food, the right to education, the right to safety is not part of what is called development. I think it raises questions is what is development if it's not about you know, people having options in life, people being able to stay safe people being able to uh, send their kids to school. So that's it basically. I'm looking forward to the discussion on this because I guess my conclusion is that we all know this, but is there enough reflection on why we're in a situation? Not everybody will necessarily agree when Antonia and I, we say that there is slippage and that the situation is of more concern for different reasons, including what I started out saying, the normalization of atrocity the extent to which we are no longer perturbed by these headlines that we see. And of course, it's true, it's the last thing I will say, uh, having worked in and on uh, Cambodia, when genocide in Cambodia happened, I was a young UN volunteer in Sri Lanka, and it took me a while, this is going back to the late 70s, 79, when we didn't, was, you know, we didn't have internet and all the rest. But nowadays, it's, it's front and center about what is going on in our world and why it's happening. It's not news or it's not a big question mark as to why we're on this track. So basically, that's what I'm putting on the table. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion. So apologies. Uh, please note that uh, Everyone is muted, so uh, before you speak, kindly unmute your uh, mic. Um, thank you very much, Nora. The floor is open. Uh, Niels. 
thanks so much for those reflections, uh, Nora. Um, <clears throat> it is a slippage, um, but it is also um, an issue already in 1980 uh, and onwards, when I certainly got involved in refugee work in January 1980, we have always had this issue of how far to push the issues of protection. Um, and, and you raise several factors. It is very important to have presence because when you don't have international presence, you, you have much higher risk of the persecution towards civilian population. Um, you have had those in the UN who feel that having a good relation, for instance, with uh, a government might help gain better protection than advocating strongly and denouncing the government. And we have had within the UN families, colleagues favoring one side uh, or the other side. Um, then when we look at the three key NGOs, uh, sorry, UN agencies involved in humanitarian action in terms of resources. World Food Program, UNICEF and UNHCR. In UNHCR, the concept of protection has always centered on refugees, um, asylum, non-refoulement, uh, but they have seen the protection of rights such as education and health, community services, um, you know, whatever we have in, in the Convention on the Rights of the Child or on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, that they have seen more as an assistance issue. So those dealing with protection in UNHCR deal with refugee protection, protection of asylum, non refoulement and the protection of the other rights are not viewed as a protection issue. They are viewed as a, an assistance issue. In UNICEF, we have tended to have uh, very marked in some years back, those in UNICEF and particularly UNICEF representatives who would say that, oh, you are involved with these IDPs and refugees, but many more are dying in Sudan because of lack of vaccination or because of malnutrition or whatever, uh, creating an animosity between humanitarian action and development work um, that shouldn't be there. And in WFP, they have never, they have always looked at the issues of reaching the 100 million that they reach, uh, including all the refugees and IDPs that are helped with food. They see it, tend to see it more as a logistics issue and not as fulfilling uh, humanitarian law uh, where civilians have the right of access to health and food. So simply to say that we have ingrained structural issues also within the UN family. So it's not only a slippage in the lack of values of NGOs and others, uh, and not trying to confront uh, including Sweden, confronting Sweden on the issues of the return of uh, the wives and children of ISIS fighters back to Sweden. There are 56 countries, uh, 56 nationalities in those camps in Syria that should be returned to countries that have not been returned. Uh, but I, I think because UNHCR, UNICEF and WFP have these cultural issues that they haven't tackled. I think that it should also be part of your work of what do we do to change and improve uh, values and attitudes and protection. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Another. Yes, can I? Yes, please. Hi. Thank you very much. I was ask, I asked myself if you two or perhaps others in the group are as disturbed as I am about the lack of teeth 
that the UN agencies have been exerting in the last 10 or more years on human rights. Uh, it's sort of slipped into second class activities. And I wonder, is that related to corporate capture, which has grown tremendously in every single agency? Is it because public interest civil society organizations have not basically had any chance to influence the United Nations decisions where member states in any discussions related to the topics that we are interested in, development, humanitarian situation, are the ones who call the shots. Public interest institutions are given a token couple minutes to intervene and whatever they propose is put in brackets and then very elegantly forgotten. Is that related also to the fact, for instance, in the case of UNICEF, which is very close to my heart and to some of your hearts, has always had a United States DG, always appointed by the government that is that happens to be uh, in, 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 in charge in the United States. The same is true for WFP, although there is an alter alternation there between Canada and the United States. We have not been able, as committed human rights activists, to get the United Nations to stand by what its charter is. And I'm really disturbed about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Yes, Sarimini, then Angela after that. Thank you very much. Um, it's just so sobering. And um, I think what you brought into to our attention, it's something that we don't maybe articulate enough. What is this slippage? And um, sometimes I don't know if it's a perception or it's a reality that what is it that's slipping in? I mean, a kind of ability to mobilize collective outrage because of what you described or articulated as a normalization of the brutality of violations in war. And, and what's causing that? Um, is it just that we're being pummeled all the time and so there's a numbness and there's this kind of perception that, that things are not going to change? And I, I don't know to what extent that's uh, a personal perception or a collective um, uh, reality. But anyway, there are so many things. My question I'm going to ask uh, if you could speak a little bit more about, and that has to do with the grave violations against children and armed conflict, that Security Council agenda. I don't know how familiar you are with it. It was quite perceived to be quite successful, the six grave violations. And um, it really did have teeth for a while you know, like it really had impact and it did actually, I think, and what I was able to perceive, it, it created um, uh, change in, in, um, in governments more perhaps and some armed groups. But the one violation that was never turned into a trigger, um, the, okay, the killing and maiming child recruitment was the first trigger of sexual violence, abduction and attacks on schools and hospitals, but humanitarian access, was never made into a trigger because they couldn't even somehow accurately measure that violation because access to populations in need was so difficult to determine. And it goes, it speaks to the point of what you said about presence and protection. So I just didn't know if you had any thoughts about how to how to measure, how to identify, how to codify that violation of when humanitarian access becomes a, a, a weapon of war, as it did in Syria, but it was never, it was never um, actually turned into, um, that they were never able to actually determine it as the motivation for the prevention of access. They use safety or other issues. So I just didn't know if you had any further comments on that. And thank you. Sorry to go on so long. Thank you, Salamini. Angela. Yeah, thank you very much. My question is regarding the, the, the language of human rights seems to be always 
as far as I can see, relegated to sort of things happening elsewhere or things that the UN and the Security Council and people, you know, are, are debating with. It seems like the, the normal, it, it doesn't seem to be a normal conversation within, within countries just by themselves. So even within the United States or within Britain or within, you don't hear it in the positions of political parties during an election. You don't hear these kind of issues being talked about internally as things that, you know, this party or that party or the government of this or the United Kingdom or France it kind of upholds. It's, and so therefore, sort of galvanizing attention to then what is happening to a big crisis you know, happening outside um, see, seems to be difficult. And I'm wondering, you know, do, do you have a comment on that? Is, is there space to actually make these issues part of the narrative and the conversation within every country so that when we see an outrage going on in Syria or Ethiopia, pe people can actually you know, take to the streets and say, look, UK, what are you doing about why are you trading with this and that country or why are you letting this thing happen? Yes, thank you very much, Angela. Fantastic question. Yes, Jim. So um, particularly your remarks uh, remind me of something I was thinking about through this whole conversation. Uh, and, and that is that the agencies that you guys have spent your life working with and that were defined here uh, that are on the firing line for this, um, one way or the other, your communications with the peoples, the populations, the citizens of the member states have made a dramatic difference in the way the world sees problems through the years. And you may think of, for example, the UNICEF, you know, USA uh, committee as basically a fundraising device, but it is also a tremendous educational device of the populations who have some impact on the leaders of the countries that do the appropriation of the funds and go into all those UN meetings and make all those decisions and listen or not listen. And I just think that one thing that we should think about at this point is how do we make sure that all of our messaging is taking these messages that you're so passionate about, and I've heard you for so many weeks in these, these meetings talk about, you have some opportunities to go back through your hierarchy of those organizations into the messaging that they're putting out and, and the people are seeing. So I'm reminded of going to the governor's uh, dinner party in Georgia, where uh, UNICEF was bringing a message. Uh, and they, I was there because they invited President and Mrs. Carter, who had, who had, he had been a former governor, of course. So they were reliving the success of that program of going into state capitals and having governors convene uh, key donors to understand what it was that UNICEF was actually doing. And that, I only did, I did one of those and I did one that they asked President Carter to do where he convened a group of those same donors. But those were extraordinary uh, meetings to get to real opinion leaders in the American society about the necessity of that. And you can imagine if Jimmy Carter was involved in those, there was a big human rights component. And he talked about the unpopularity of what he did as US president on human rights on a global basis. But then that they talked about the legacy of that. And one of the strain, one of the one of the threads in all of that was the fact that the agencies 
started to pick up on some of the actions he took, the UN agencies picked up on actions that he took and that made a huge difference in the world. Didn't solve the problem, but it made a difference. And then I think back to something I've said before on this, which was the fundraising that we did at the Carter Center, where we took, where we went from no, no knowledge whatsoever in the general public in America about neglected tropical diseases and how you know, our direct mail program of millions of letters that went out from a source that people could would at least listen to and hear those stories and the kind of difference that made in the way the population of America felt about, uh, first of all, to even know that those diseases existed and to understand how important it was to help those people. But in all that message, I have had have, have this told to me about thousands of people, some of them really important people like Ann Cox Chambers. Uh, Bill Gates said it again on TV the other day. Only in going to Africa could he have ever understood what was actually happening there and how that was at the absolute root of all of his work. And he was, he was making that comment uh, as he was talking uh, about his new book on, on, uh, on, on climate and on, on uh, uh, climate change. But for him to trace that back to going and seeing is really an important message for us. So this whole mechanism that we've all been a part of one way or the other has, has a responsibility. And let me just say, well, I think it has a responsibility, but it has an opportunity through all of its channels to do something about what, what was spoken. I don't think this just has to happen in the UN meetings. I think that one way or the other, if you added it all up, you would be unbelievably surprised by the, by the number of people that read the materials that come out of the fundraising for the collective set of UN agencies and the set of NGOs that cultivate and work with that community on and over. And that is an extraordinarily uh, viable and successful community. So I just would put that in your pot. One way to deal with the issues you've laid out so thoughtfully today would be going back and saying, what do we do? Uh, are, we, are we sending the right messages through our fundraising? And so, you know, some of the fundraisers who are only interested in the bottom line might at first say, well, you know, that's not our job, but we've got to put the things that are most, you know, the flies in your eyes, the most, you know, the most, most scary things. We got, that's what we've got to use, but we can combat that. And, and uh, but I just think that's something that I take away from this, that we, you express a problem, it could be dealt with, and we have some control over how we deal with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim, an important issue that you know, shifts the focus to, to what we can do with messaging as part of that. That's really critical. Uh, another uh, comment and uh, question. Fred. Thanks. <clears throat> Just a quick riff, a comment on what Claudio and Nils brought up about the normalization of atrocity and the unequal uh, teeth available to try and fight them some of the worst atrocities it seems to me are being carried out every day by superpowers. And in a riff on what uh, George Orwell put in a, uh, Animal House, it seems like all member states are created equal, but some are more equal than others. So clearly uh, targeted assassination without trial by drone or by bombing, uh, explosions of scientists in other countries, uh, use of unspeakable weapons, creation of black sites, whether it's in China or in the United States or in Cuba, um, keeping of children in cages, uh, offshore torture, etc. All of these unspeakable acts seem to go uncriticized or relatively little criticized when they're carried out by the biggest actors. It's, it's a parallel to what happens with the UN agencies as they get power. They can get away with murder because they're run by the largest funders, donors, political actors in the system. I don't know, it, it, there is no solution I can think of short of restructuring the UN, which is not gonna happen in my lifetime. But I wonder whether you have any comment or reaction to these observations, over. Thank you very much. We'll take one more comment if there is one and then- uh, Martin? Yeah, Martin. Everett? 
please. Great. Yeah, no, I, I think there are so many fantastically important issues uh, being raised here um, that it, it's perhaps it's difficult to know what to, to focus on. So I just wanted to um, make one comment and ask one question. Um, a colleague has referred to what's been happening to UN humanitarian action, and I think it also includes the ICRC as technocratization. Uh, and, and that is that it's all become a technical effort, uh, divorced from human rights, uh, divorced from the perceptions of the people who we're all supposed to be assisting. And um, I mean, this gets, takes me back to a question, Nora, which is, do you think that sometimes um, we are allowing um, UN agencies to get away with fudging the meaning of protection. I mean, I can identify four quite distinct meanings for the word protection. And when a few years ago, I asked UNHCR if they wouldn't mind being a little more explicit about what they were talking about when they used the word protection, they said no. They, essentially, they say they like the ambiguity. They like being unclear about what protection means, whether it means protection by force, protection by persuasion, uh, legal protection, or, or social protection. And, and so I, I just feel that we, we allow the debate to be dominated by, by fundraising and by technical issues. Uh, and we need to come back to human rights and local local leadership. Great, that's great, Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, then what I would just uh, make one comment and, and then we'll turn it over to you to uh, Nora and Antonio. Now, I just finished a book on the history of human rights or not history, the idea, yeah. And what happened in the enlightenment period where this term came from. Uh, and the changing concepts in the 1700s about uh, rights. Uh, and this uh, author, rightly or wrongly, but she characterized the social attitudes toward inhumanity, torture, the Inquisition, the period of the Inquisition, the, uh, all of the terrible things that people did uh, at that time in various uh, names of religion and governance and how that shifted and the population had begun to have a different concept about what was acceptable or not acceptable. Anyway, I couldn't help but think that you're, you know, because it re relates in a way to this changing social values that can happen as to whether we all gather at the guillotine and cheer on the torture uh, or whether we see it as abhorrent and what, how that works and why. Anyway, just my reflection. Nora, over to you and Antonio. Uh, maybe I'll say a few things. I, I, I thought that the, um, uh, the comments were all very um, sort of on the ball. Uh, in a sense, I would e even go further on, the, on two issues, on the issue of slippage and on the issue of the structure of the system. On slippage, uh, a friend of mine claims that uh, the word human rights never appeared in any UNDP document until the late 1980s. I haven't verified if this is true, but I think they started talking about human security and then vaguely about human rights. So there is a kind of blindness to these issues in the system. And you see this blindness, uh, Nora and I were both working on a a major report on protection in the study, context of yes. study, study on, on protection. What was it called? The whole of system system. review of protection in the context of humanitarian action. But commissioned by the IASC. Commissioned by the IASC. And we were recruited, a uh, team of four, by uh, NRC to do this. And uh, we did various field visits. And uh, like Nora, uh, but wasn't the same study, I was invited, I was asked to go to Myanmar, hosted by UNHCR. And it was fascinating because we had a UN country team meeting where we presented the study and we started it but provocatively by asking, well, what does the word protection mean for you? Please write it down on a post-it. 
and give it to us. And it was amazing. The, uh, um, the resident humanitarian coordinator refused to answer. The, the responsible of um, the director of an agency that has protection in its mandate said, oh, when there's a protection issue, I ask my protection people. The uh, representative of a, a major agency that does food distribution says, well, you know, we're not really involved in this because it's my protection officers who deal with it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then you're surprised if the system did not respond um, like it did not respond in Sri Lanka, it did not respond in Myanmar, because obviously there's a problem with the staff on the ground, but I think the main problem is with the leadership. And here, I think the slippage compared to where is uh, Jim Grant when we need him? You know, there was a period when the, there were leaders in the UN system that would stand up to power and abuse and would send, as Jim Grant did, what was it? Bubbles of tranquility down corridors of peace, um, you know, in the Sudan. But so we don't have those leaders anymore. And I think that the current SG, um, various articles have come out basically saying that he has uh, uh, decapitated the uh, protection and humanitarian concerns on the 38th floor for his own political reasons. But the result is that it's become more difficult, I think, to raise certain issues than um, in the past. The other point I wanted to make is about structure. And uh, uh, I think it was Fred who mentioned, well, you know, are you surprised all the money comes from Western donors? The P5 are the biggest killers. I think it's true. So if you go back to 1945, the P5 are those who have uh, uh, bombed, the most bombed, bombed the most hospitals. Uh, and so is it surprising that on the one hand, you have the organization controlled by these P5 and all the funding for human rights and humanitarian action is basically extra budgetary fund, not all of it, but a large part of it. And when we talk about, there's a lot of talk in the NGO sphere about decolonizing humanitarian aid or decolonizing aid in general and decolonizing the UN. I think there's a major issue there, unless we change the way in which money flows through the system and power flows with this money, we're not going to be able to address some of the issues that we've been discussing for the past hour. Over. Okay. Nora, you take over. Actually, how much more time do we have, Everett? Uh, I would ask the group that, and if anybody has to leave, they can, but we would uh, ask, you know, the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Well, okay, because Antonio covered certain of the issues and I mean I took great notes because I agree with Antonio lots of important points made which actually is not a surprise given this uh, select group given your experience so I'm not I will try not to go through them one by one um, and Antonio made reference to the whole of system report as a commission by the interagency standing committee and he mentioned NRC that was just the administrative part of it they issued the contracts and you know there partly to comment on what Neil said you know HCR was what can I say? I won't say very lukewarm, very un enthused, because it was pushed through actually after what had happened in Sri Lanka and it was pushed through by NGOs mostly. And, you know, it was a big exercise. Uh, it partly contributed to the Centrality Protection Declaration. But if I go back, because it was done in 14, 15, if I go back now and see, has it changed anything on the ground much? I would say no. I mean, that's what came out when I did a study. I said for a big donor, in Syria two years ago. Um, yeah, for me, upsetting that the debate around it or the debate around these issues doesn't play out on the front lines. But I will come back to that. Um, Claudio, um, lack of teeth. Yeah, I think Antonio has dealt with that, that uh, it's very difficult. It seems the leadership of the UN, but not just the UN, all the NGOs to bite into issues that are seen to be controversial and on the way I also see counterproductive to their fundraising efforts. I mean, here in Europe, since 2015, what well, was called the big um, march, people arriving mostly from Syria, also from Iraq and Afghanistan, and walking through Europe uh, to reach asylum. And, you know, if you see it's actually difficult to see what UNH, I don't know what they're doing behind the scenes, but the extent to which UNHCR has challenged that or, yeah, tried to demand that Europe delivers on its responsibilities as it uh, beefs up all its deterrence um, practices. 
of results and it's documented, you know, the number of people who die in the Mediterranean as a result, um, I think shows that uh, the system, when I talk about slippage, I was speaking more actually in my own head about the treaties and then saying all along, the big agencies also have been quite delinquent. And my concern is that as we go forward, the combination of what member states are doing and then what important uh, humanitarian development agencies are doing, I think that the, what beckons is, um, is, is, is quite frightening. I'm, I'm going to mispronounce your name, Sademini, Sademini. That's correct, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, how do we articulate this? And uh, in terms of 1612 and yes, CAC. Um, I actually think it's, it's, it's the problem we, we have across the system. I mean, I've had different varied experience with 1612 when I worked in Afghanistan. I was antagonistic actually to a dedicated group on, on this because we had a protection group and we had a subgroup in protection, but the small office in New York then wanted to have a dedicated group to deal with the government and NATO, ISAF, and didn't want to deal, totally didn't want to deal with the armed opposition. At that point, I was head of the human rights team in Yunama, and we resisted, you know, fragmenting this more because our position was that if we're focused, which was, has to be our focus on reducing the impact of war on children and their families, we had to talk to all of the warring parties. So how, how to measure, or you asked how to measure, you know, access. I mean, it, it's not ever going to be, I think, an exact science at, at the moment, but I think there was more than enough evidence, if we're speaking specifically about Syria, to, and lots have talked about it and written it up, the weaponization of food, the weaponization of healthcare, and, uh, and thus also the sieges, um, you know, the weaponization of uh, people's right to re receive support from, the, from humanitarian uh, actors. Uh, but it's, but, and, and, you know, some people to challenge that, but, but not the big entities. I mean, the focus for many, and I, I can understand it, even if I have question marks about it, was, was the cross-border program which I think still somehow persists. Um, Angela, you raised questions about um, human rights, which of course is a big discussion and the language that we used. Uh, oh yeah, the, we, we see human rights as we do crises as problems over there. And well, I think, you know, unfortunately it's a separate discussion, the human rights machinery of which I've been a part, you know, it, it's, it comes out of, out of a legal school, and I think it's often quite delinquent and not being able to understand realities on the ground, because quite often if you're working in a crisis situation, you're working in a lawless situation. It's the lawless situation, the absence of an independent judiciary or independent police that is part of your problem. Um, but if I jump to Ireland, which, you know, I, I, the country I grew up in for a big part of my life, uh, very traditional when I was growing up in the 1950s, it was seen as a third world country because it was poor and had many of the characterizations of a third world country, you know, rural based, high diaspora and all the rest. But it has changed and in, in this past two decades. So when I guess now it's about five years ago when it was the first country, I think, to have a vote, um, a nationwide vote on equality in marriage, as it was called, same sex marriage. The arguments or the debate that was put forward by the it was a coalition of groups uh, was basically about love. They never mentioned rights. And I, I was I became aware of this um, quite quickly. I was still working in Afghanistan. Oh no, I wasn't working in Afghanistan. But you know, so I think, you know, it's always been my experience that if we want to advance on human rights and get buy-in, one has to articulate the values of human rights in a way that is understood in different cultural and social political contexts. So um, moving on to question number five. Take these messages. That's Georgia. Georgia, yeah. Can I just good? interject something Please. while you look at your papers? I, I forget if it's a Stephen Hopgood or somebody else who, who makes a distinction between human rights with a capital H and a capital R and human rights um, with a uh, lowercase. And his argument is that the capital H, capital R human rights does not work. The institutions are very 
uh, they're there. They ha they have all these beautiful treaties, but the the actual practice on the ground doesn't translate. Whereas in the lowercase human rights, a lot can be accomplished. And uh, I think that, uh, as Nora just said, moving away from a legalistic approach to human rights is probably the way to go in, in many uh, situations where you're basically dealing with. Uh, a very fraught environments where you know uh, insurgents, uh, lawless uh, militias, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so yeah, so the question was, you know, how to articulate this in everyday life, and I totally agree. I think it has to be very context specific, and um, and then when I started out of this discussion, because I knew it was a short amount of time, you know, I was setting out that of course these standards are important, and when I express concern about human rights machinery in the way it often doesn't work, it doesn't mean that I'm antagonistic to the machinery, on the contrary. And then to jump to this point of how to make it part of everyday life, I mean, I spent a short, short time in Lesbos in 2015 because I could. I was sitting here watching the news every evening and seeing these people arriving on this island, which was 80,000 people, and you had, yeah, People and numbers of people arriving was a few thousand and marching through Europe trying to get asylum in, in, within the EU. And having had this short ex, this short experience, where meeting people getting off plastic dinghies, they were mostly Syrians. So I can say two or three things. These were young people. Uh, young people arriving from Syria were mostly young men because they were trying to escape the war, being dragooned into being fighters on, on either side. And some of the first things they said was, "Thank you." for acknowledging that we're people too. And if I contrast that to the 80s when I started working by accident on the Thai Cambodian border, you know, it's a world of difference. I'm not saying that no progress has been made. Uh, what I am saying is that I'm concerned about the progress that has been made is in danger of, uh, of being further weakened and fragmented and of being less and less valued. Um, Fred's question, normalization of atrocity. Uh huh. I think actually Antonio has answered that quite well. So Martin's comment, yeah, fudging. I think actually, and the meaning of protection. I mean, for me, it's always been about safety and dignity. And depending on what context I'm in, including when I worked in the Cambodian border, I had the advantage of being able to grab a hold of a, Cambod of a Buddhist monk, Cambodian monk, coming back en route from Paris to Australia. And we ended up working with this for two years where to talk about human rights from that cultural and social political perspective. So fudging in human rights, yeah, I mean, the whole of system review looks at it quite closely because it's basically, as I found in Syria two years ago, it's what I call feel gut stuff, it's about do no harm. And of course, do no harm is absolutely vital, absolutely important, it's the starting point, but it's where a lot of folks and agencies stop because after that, you know, if you're challenging abuse, you're always the most horrible person in the room, no two ways about it. If any time you're challenging abuse, challenging discrimination, calling attention to it, no matter how politely you talk or anything else, you're always in an uncomfortable environment. And if one isn't prepared, to a challenge abuse uh, because it's complicated or yeah, makes keep you awake at night, then probably you're not going to get far. But then on the positive note on this, because I made a note when Martin was saying it, I was in Gaziantep, I was part of the study for the donor, because uh, I, yeah, to meet agencies there working in Northern Syria. And what was reassuring is that there's a lot of, uh, what I'm going to say new or pop-up agencies, Syrians who were, you know, have home, homes in France or Syrians who have come from elsewhere and working with local groups. And for them, it was totally impossible to understand how the formal humanitarian system was so unable, unwilling um, to face up to what the nature of the problems were. So my point here is that in the future, I see that as the world changes um, and there's more middle income countries, et cetera, et cetera, that it's going to be local groups that will be best placed and best able to challenge um, policies and practices and attitudes of abuse. And this is not to say that we, we won't need international systems because it will still be necessary to see what's going on in the Security Council, et cetera, and it's still necessary to have networks. But that for me, I came away disappointed is a polite word about it, but what I was seeing in the formal system that also energized and, and a bit reassured about 
people from community were directly affected that they were taking it between their teeth and doing what they could about it. Okay, I think I talked for too long, but Everett talked about the history and changing social values. Yeah, um, I don't know, and I want, I looked it up earlier in the week. ICRC did a service, my last point. ICRC did a survey that came out, actually they do it periodically, but the last one, because it was their four year annual, four year event, what do you Conference. call it? For conference. Right, go, go, go. I don't know if anybody in the room here, online room, is aware of it, but they did a survey in different countries, including in Europe, people's attitudes to torture. And it's like totally alarming. A lot of it seems to be driven by terrorism, a term I personally never use because I don't know what it means, because we will talk about ISIS as, yeah, but not about ACID as um, employing acts of terror when clearly he did. But basically, that survey in Switzerland and other countries in Europe, something like more than 40% of the population said it was okay, waterboarding, it was okay, because if, if that's what's needed, you know, to keep, um, I guess, our lives safe or to keep acts of terror from not happening on our doorstep. So at one level, you can say, you know, how poor can the understanding be of this situation? And at another level, you know, it, it's a flashing light to say that one can never rest. If one is concerned about injustices and atrocities, there are sometimes improvements, but uh, one can never really rest because there's more of us on the planet, more of us being harmed. And um, in, in our own backyard and front gardens, but also elsewhere, we have to keep challenging um, what we're comfortable in meeting out to other people. And this is what I said after Lesbos, you know, if we don't want them, as in Europe, we're well able to absorb a million people. If we don't want them, let's stop bombing them. And that's what I've challenged agencies, NGOs and others in Ireland, for example, when it was campaigning to be on the security Council now is that aid agents should invest more, my last last comment, should invest more in their home countries in educating people and help them understand why they rattle cans to get support, which they need to do programs in Tigre or South Sudan or whatever, that it can't just be, yeah, handing over a little bit of money, that we need to invest more in saying how we're interdependent, how we're interconnected. Thanks. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. And uh, so in our usual tradition, we'll quickly go around final comments. Uh, Angela, you're muted. Okay. Yeah, I think that last point, there is so much more work to be done at home before we all go out and I, I and pe people have been saying that since I've been in development and humanitarian work but it it just still never happens so work at home as yeah. well yeah. thank you very much by the way it was a great talk Vernon uh, just to echo what Angela said that's a very significant point for me as well thank you very much uh, Nora and Nino you know. Jim, you're muted. Thank you very much. I agree with working at home. Pilar. Thank you. Thank you, Nora and Antonio. I think it's a tremendous presentation. Um, yes, working at home. Thanks. Thanks. Martin. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think this is a great time to be outraged and to take action while at home. And by the way, yesterday we came up with a new um, definition of DNA. And DNA now stands for Data Narrative Action. That's great. That's great. Thank you. Saudamini. Thanks uh, so very much. I think what you've done, you've really articulated the, these very difficult questions with impossible answers and we have to keep asking them. I, um, on the question of leadership, I just also wanted to add, I, I remember it was a lot of years ago when we were talking about a dearth of leadership and now it seems so much worse, how much worse can it get? And then the collective will, the collective outrage, that normalization of violation, it just, um, thank you for asking all those questions. 
Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, was struck by the, the uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the word you use is slippage. I think you might call it atrocity fatigue in some sense, and people feel powerless in response to all that they learn about that's going on that is so sobering. Uh, the importance, I think, that you emphasized about uh, continuing to talk about uh, welcoming other human beings as human beings and seeing them in the flesh and uh, not allowing people to do what I call uh, purposive disregard of their humanity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Niels, you're muted. Sorry, I didn't hear my name. Uh, thanks so much to all. I support also the issues of local. I think uh, Nora and Antonio uh, look at two additional issues. One is that the relative power of support functions in the UN in 1980 was relatively small. Okay, that led to uh, misuse of funds sometimes and so on. But in those days, 30% of the staff were involved in support functions. Now in the UN, and certainly when you look at the, the humanitarian agencies, 70% of the staff uh, are involved in support functions. So the relative power has increased to having the books in order, but not standing up for human rights. I think that needs to also be studied a little bit uh, because the assistant uh, executive director is in, in charge of admin and finance they tend to simply call the shots nowadays not the leaders that lead programs uh, a second point that my colleagues always hear me talk about and i want to leave with you is that the humanitarian community is still very far from recognizing the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I've seen in refugee camps, autistic children chained and whatnot with UNHCR staff having no clue about it, WFP uh, or UNICEF, no involvement of any significance in mental health conditions and syndromes. So we need a lot of work in that. Okay, thanks so much for today. Claudio. Thank you. We have spoken about leadership and outrage. What comes to mind to me is the fate of our Jordanian prince as a head of the HCR and how he was eked out for clearly political reasons when he was doing a very good job. So I think this fits into what we have been discussing today. Uh, Leadership is important in the UN agencies, but it has to become more on the basis of merits than on political appointees. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Fred. Yeah, great whirlwind of ideas you guys brought up. Thank you, Antonio and, and uh, Nora. Just a last comment on this uh, local groups. I think in retrospect, where the UN and the humanitarian community has been most effective is when it's been able to transfer power Fred, to those well-meaning local groups. Uh, we can't hear you. Shoot. Hi. Forget it then. Thanks a lot. It was great hearing you. Over. Thanks. Ed. Final comment, Ed? Yes, first of all, I, I, I missed bits and pieces because I was driving and the signal came and went. But I, I think just, I mean, I, I really, I, I, I've discussed many times with Nora and Antonio also about this. Uh, I think only one, again, reminder is that we do need better local and international reporting, but we have to provide uh, the means for a lot of these journalists to do it. We recently had, in fact, last week, the Martin Ennals Awards in Geneva. And, um, you know, a lot of the reporting was, you know, announcing the awards and whatnot, but what we need is really background reporting that goes on for months, investigating human rights abuses, such as, you know, in China, uh, also Saudi Arabia, and I, I, we can just go down the list. So I, I think it's, you know, all of these issues, leadership and so on, 
go hand in hand with the need to really put these issues out there. And it's just not happening right now, apart from the major media, such as the BBC or New York Times, that we have to involve local press. We have to involve local journalists as well as internationals willing to take the time to get to the nitty gritty about what's happening. Thanks very much again. Ed, thank you very much. Nora and Antonio, final comments to you. Two final comments. One on uh, the local. Here in Bellevue, on the outskirts of Geneva, we had a facility, now it's been closed down or moved, where we had um, about 25 very young Afghan asylum seekers and three Syrian families. And we. 50 well, they, they Sorry, were, when they were in the bunker, you? there were more, but then they and moved 25? them out of the bunker. And uh, so we created a small um, a small NGO in the village. Uh, and what was, uh, two things struck me then. One, that there was no negative uh, pushback oh, from the population. The we The idea was to set up, to help with the integration of these uh, young people, but also to um, ease out dialogue. any tensions that they might come with the social, with the local population. And there was very little, hardly any. The second thing is um, um, about, um, what was the second thing? Um, oh, no, that DNA, uh, data narrative action. That is what uh, we with uh, United Against Inhumanity are trying to do. Use data to influence advocacy, to influence the behavior of uh, the powers that be that commit atrocities, whether it's states or non-state armed actors. So I think that there, there is a, there is a space for this kind of reporting that is based on, uh, on, on information that is credible and that is uh, uh, verifiable and that is promoted in a way that uh, um, lends itself to mobilizing civil society to uh, try to change facts on the ground. And thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity to uh, peddle our wares. No, I, I'm not going to add to what Antonio to say, other than to say, really appreciate this moment as of reflection to exchange ideas. I mean, we've all been uh, in different corners of the world and have been around the block a few times. So it's great to get insights and feedback from different angles. So I wish you the best for the rest of your meeting. Thank, thank, you, thank you all. Very much. Thank you very much, everyone. We really appreciate it. And uh, have a good week and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.